Chapter 29, The Search for Order in an Era of Limits, 1973-1980. Talking about the 1970s here. So the 1970s was a decade that was like a 1960s hangover. So much had happened in the 60s, and then it was just kind of over. Vietnam ended, the civil rights movement regarding any group quieted way down. Crazy politics and revolutionaries had nothing to revolt about. So the 70s was like an opposite of the 60s. Peace and love was replaced by the me decade. More of a self-serving era where you take care of your own interests, okay? But the, the 70s would, would prove to be the era where politics would never be the same. All the distrust of the government that was happening, the baby boomers stopped trusting the people in charge. This led to eras that demanded more transparency from their government. We, we, we want to see what's going on. We want, we want to know what you're doing, transparency. Uh, so remember, the feelings change from the greatest generation going back where they believe in the honor of the government at all costs. They would support anything the government suggested, including supporting the Vietnam War. But, of course, their, their children, the baby boomers, are questioning authority. They don't want to go to war, okay? So all this kind of kind of comes to a head, and this will this will end in a in a change in 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 politics where people don't trust the government very much anymore. Okay. Also, in the 1970s, the economy would falter greatly. Uh, there was there was no longer a war to fuel the economy, and the general feeling in the 70s was depression and general negativity. So the war is over, and the economy. Drops like like is typical post-war. Now we didn't see that in World War II. Uh, the American economy kept booming because of the efforts to rebuild Europe that that kept manufacturing going. But not here. This is a whole different type of war. It's not a world war. So when the Vietnam War ends, the economy uh, plummets. Okay. Uh, of course, the big event of the decade is the Watergate scandal. Uh, what what is the Watergate scandal? This is a Break-in of the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate Hotel became known as the Watergate Scandal. So it's called Watergate because the break-in that starts the whole event happened at the Watergate Hotel. That's the only reason, okay? This would prove to be the rotten cherry on the top of the Nixon administration and ultimately would drive him to resign. So again, going back to sabotaging the peace talks, that didn't do it bombing Cambodia against the wishes of the American people or uh, Congress. That didn't do it. <clears throat> this event will do it, okay? So the event happens. It begins with this DNC, Democratic National Committee. There's a burglary there, and five men are arrested for breaking into the office. It was initially written off as an amateuristic burglary, but then it turned out that two of the men, two of the burglars, were former CIA and FBI so from the very start, this looked somewhat suspicious. 72 was an election year. So a lot of things go on in election years. And this, this makes people perk up a little bit and take a closer look. But Nixon said he had no knowledge of anything about this break-in. He's got no clue. This would later prove out to be a blatant lie. The first of many, okay, regarding this event anyway. Um but the truth is, Nixon running for a second term, incumbent president, hugely popular. So he, he's like a cat with nine lives. All the things we talked about, Paris peace talks, the, of course, nobody knew about that yet, but, but also the bombing of Cambodia, he, he kind of gets his popularity back because he's de-escalating the war. So many young people jump on his bandwagon and he's pretty popular. Who's running against him? George McGovern, a senator from South Dakota, a liberal Democrat, running on the platform of anti-war, uh, return of prisoners of war, call for amnesty for draft evaders. This, of course, didn't go over very well with the greatest generation, the conservative vote. They were not ready to forgive draft dodgers who went to Canada, young people who refused to fight in the war, young men, went to Canada to avoid the draft. The, the greatest generation thought they were cowards. Uh McGovern also campaigned on a huge reduction of the military, also not popular with the greatest generation, okay? But truthfully, Nixon, never never a chance he wouldn't win this election. This turned out to be one of the largest landslides in the history of the United States, 
and Richard Nixon comes to power, okay? So let's do a supplemental lecture here, number 14, called Richard Nixon. And we're going to look at him and his life and his history a little closer. Very interesting man. And here's our sketch outline. Number one, background development. A, known for his part in Watergate. B, why? C, had long history of questionable behavior. Number two, history. A, McCarthy. B, checkers. C, debate. D, corrupt election. E, Shauna. Number three, Watergate. A, break in. B, Woodward and Bernstein. Number four is relevance. The Watergate scandal changed American politics forever, ending the do not question authority point of view. Today, as a result, Americans question their leadership and think more critically about the presidency. Okay? Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> so there never was much of a threat, like I said, for Nixon to lose this election. Uh, many people, young people, supported him. Uh, so remember, as part of this surge of conservatism in the country, but he wins this landslide victory over McGovern. So as the story unfolds, as you learn about what this Watergate incident's about, it's hard not to ask the question, why, why, Richard Nixon, would you do these things? You didn't have to. You were going to win easily, but he does anyway. It would turn out that Nixon didn't need any intelligence about McGovern. McGovern never had a chance, but he does it anyway. And this is part of his personality. He's obsessed with himself. Nixon the Great, obsessed with his place in history. And he wanted to orchestrate his administration uh, to be up there with the likes of Washington, Lincoln, and FDR. Uh, so Nixon had been a controversial person in, in politics since the beginning and has these somewhat odd moments and, and decisions that he makes. So let's go back to the beginning of his political career briefly and just hit a few main points that points out his 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 shady past, okay? <clears throat> So originally kind of comes on the political scene as a member of the McCarthy uh, organization, HUAC, uh, House of Un-American Activities Commu um, Committee. Uh, this, these are the people that went on the witch hunt for communists. Nixon was a fervent anti-communist, okay? He supported McCarthy and all that McCarthy did, ruining people's lives and, and careers and, and, you know, all these all these hearings that the people came to, and in the end, how many comments did they find? Zero. Nixon was part of that. So that wasn't looked on back then as a negative so much as it is, as it is now. Joseph, Joseph McCarthy is not looked upon fondly by modern historians. Okay, so that's our first indication of perhaps his character being involved with these people that are ruining people's lives. 1952, Nixon runs on Dwight Eisenhower's ticket, as his vice president, okay? Uh, and then during the campaign, before the election was final, Nixon was accused of improprieties regarding campaign funds. There was 18,000 missing dollars, missing cash. And it looked to a lot of people like Nixon may have pocketed that cash for himself. Eisenhower got very angry with, with Nixon and said, you better fix this. You know, fix this right now or I'm going to find somebody else. So Nixon decides to make a special speech to America on TV. So again, TV's just getting off the ground here. This is still something new. And on the on the uh, in the speech, he claims innocence in the affair, in the affair, and that he was not keeping any of the funds for himself. This speech is famously known as the Checkers speech today. It, Checkers was his dog. So why would they name a speech after his dog? Well, we're going to find out here. Let's take our a break here and watch. I actually want you to watch two films back to back. Both are very short. Both are about Nixon. Uh, the, the first one is Richard Nixon, Checkers, speech number one. Watch that. And then watch Richard Nixon's Checkers, speech number two. They're somewhat of a continuation of each other. So go ahead and watch those films and then come on back. Okay, so people question, is this man trustworthy? Do you believe him? When he says, uh, was that wrong? What, what did he mean by that? Is he asking you, was it wrong for me to pocket $18,000? So people aren't sure. And he starts to get this, this idea of perhaps not being so trustworthy, okay? And, of course, the whole thing with the dog, you know, a pretty cheesy attempt at gaining sympathy 
and minimizing a very serious charge uh, and bringing his kids into it. So didn't exactly win points with that one. But amazingly, his popularity resumed. People forgave him, and Eisenhower and and, and Nixon won in 52. So uh, eight years later, he runs for president himself. 1960, he runs against John Kennedy. And they decide to uh, have a debate, and this became a very famous debate, still is, on TV. It seemed like Kennedy understood the power of TV more than Nixon did. Uh, Kennedy looked young, vibrant, regal, uh, prepared, uh, calm. Nixon was sweating. He didn't shave that day, had a five o'clock shadow wiping his nose. So he kind of came up as disheveled and untrustworthy. And Kennedy won a very close election. Many historians believe that the, the debate was the incident that pushed people to Kennedy. Now, interestingly, there's some evidence, and I would even say, Today, it's been nearly accepted as fact that there was fraud in this 1960 election. Joseph Kennedy was the father of John Kennedy, a very wealthy man and a very uh, influential man and knew all the right people in the right places, a man with connections. <clears throat> so, and, and, and Joseph Kennedy was obsessed with John Kennedy becoming the president. So it's believed that Joseph Kennedy's people fixed the vote in Texas and Illinois. And because of that, that gained John Kennedy, those states, 51 electoral votes and a majority in the Electoral College. So he didn't win by very much. So if he, if he hadn't had those 51 electoral votes from these two states, Nixon would have won. So people start to accuse Kennedy of all this, okay? And they ask Nixon, you know, what do you think about this? Now, you, you would think that a man that had spent eight years as, as a vice president, you know, Biden his time, now here's his chance to run. He goes through a whole campaign. Now the election's over. Very, very close race, and you lose by hair. But then, it's, then, then you find out that perhaps your opponent threw the election. What would you do? You'd be pretty angry. You'd be saying, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's figure this out. I should be president. <clears throat> but Kennedy, I, I'm sorry, Nixon doesn't do that. Nixon said, I, I fear that to question the results would harm the country. Did not mount a challenge. So this is odd behavior, and people started to think, well, maybe maybe he's got something to hide. Maybe if there was a if there was a complete investigation, we'd find out dirt about him. Okay, but Nixon apologists, many conservatives point at that decision as Nixon's true character, not Watergate. Okay, uh, we're going to hear that again in this in this lecture. Uh, okay, so he doesn't fight this. Uh, eight years later, he runs for president. So there's our, our question. Was Nixon robbed of the presidency in 1960? 1968 runs on, on what was called a peace with honor uh, campaign uh, while he's bombing Cambodia, right? Uh, but, but an end the war campaign. Uh, of course, we know that he sabotaged the Paris peace talks right before that too. So, so a lot of things going on here. Uh, sabotages the Paris peace talks wins the election on a end the war peace with honor campaign while he immediately starts bombing Cambodia. Okay. Uh, all this happens in his, by his third month of office. Uh, as we know, the, the bombing of Cambodia was, was authorized by Nixon without the knowledge or approval of the U S Congress. The bombings did not become public knowledge until 73, one year into his second term in which they were stopped. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> But when this came out, this is this is a subject of huge contention and led people pushing to end the entire military operation in Vietnam. Uh, so it's felt that because of Nixon's campaign to escalate the war instead of end it as he promised, this resulted in thousands of American soldiers dying as well as hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese and Cambodian civilians. So all these things you know, are on his resume. So people don't always trust him. But did he have some moments? Yes, he did. Nixon in China. This would be the apex of his administration, his high watermark, his highest point. Uh, what's this all about? Well, China had become communist in 1949. This is one of those proxy wars of the Cold War. Going back a few chapters, Truman said, I'm not going to send troops in there. 
going against his own Truman doctrine where we're going to send troops anywhere to stop this, but he doesn't do it here. And China becomes communist. And from that point on, China and America didn't have relations, didn't trade. Uh, and so nearly 20 years, they don't have any kind of interaction. But Nixon, Nixon reaches out and they have a couple of talks and so on and so on. They, and he breaks the ice and, and Nixon, uh, you know, it, it results with Nixon opening up communications with China. Uh, this is a tremendous victory for him. Uh, and so, again, as I said earlier, this is another uh, place where conservatives point to this as what he should be remembered for, not the break-in, not the bombings, not the sabotage of the Paris peace talks. Remember this, okay? Um, of course, the topper is the Watergate incident at the Watergate Hotel, okay? Uh, so Nixon, like I said, huge ego. He thought his presidency would be right up there with the, at the top presidents. So he determined early in his, in, his, in his administration that I'm going to have to keep notes of all that goes on because when I'm out of here in eight years, I'm going to write my memoirs. And, of course, the whole world will, will want to buy that because I'm so great. So how am I going to keep track of all that goes on in here? So he, he determines to install a secret recording system in the Oval Office. Only Nixon and a handful of people knew about it. So any, any conversation that took place in the Oval Office or phone call he made as president was all recorded. This would come back to haunt him in a huge, huge way. And in, in fact, would be the evidence that would bring him down with Watergate because he kept lying about what happened. But then once these tapes were turned over to the uh, Senate subcommittee and they heard them, <clears throat> the evidence was there. Nixon was forced to resign. So his own his own idea of this secret recording system comes back to to hurt him. Okay, <clears throat> so what was this breaking all about? Was to steal top secret documents, wiretap the phones, uh, and then afterward immediately. So the question of he didn't know about it immediately after this happened, he began to cover it up. He raised hush money for the burglars, pay off the burglars. He tried to stop the FBI from investigating it. He destroyed evidence. He fired uncooperative staff members. So all these things are happening. All these things are impeachable offenses. All these things are crimes, okay? Just because you're the president doesn't give you any more power than anybody else has. But this story could have died, like, like a lot of things. You, you've got a story that revol involves the president, and you ask the president, were you involved? He says no. The press believes you, at least in those days, and it might have died, except for the efforts of two uh, reporters from the Washington Post newspaper, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. They stay on it. They are relentlessly looking for evidence. <clears throat> they have an informer in the White House telling them information, and they come up with, with the evidence that finally you know, uh, destroys Nixon. They would write a book about this called All the President's Men. This would become a popular movie also. Uh, the book won them both the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so long story short, because of all, all of this going on, August 1974, after his role in the Watergate uh, scandal finally became knowledge, Nixon was forced to resign. Uh, and, of course, the young people in America are ecstatic. We, we brought him down, all of our protests and counterculture and all the things we've been doing all this time work because we brought the man down okay and now they're going to perhaps arrest him and char charge him with crimes and convict him but right after he's he's uh he resigns nixon's vice president <clears throat> Harold ford pardoned him for all crimes he committed or may have committed so he gets off scot-free never prosecuted to the anger of many he'd broken the law he used the power of the presidency for personal gain and lied repeatedly to the American public. So he earns the moniker Tricky Dicky, <clears throat> okay? Uh, not someone you can trust. You can't, you can't believe what this man's saying. Uh, and again, the biggest question that people ask is, why did you do that? You didn't have to. You didn't have to worry about re-election. You're going you're gonna to do it easy. But just a huge ego, control freak, very paranoid about his enemies, closing in on him. 
So he wanted to gain an advantage. So this, this event is what turns the American public to not trust the government so much. And it still is that way today. It might be turning around a little bit, but in, in the 70s and 80s, you didn't trust anything the government said. The war is long over. The anti-war and the protests and the hippies, that's, that's long over. But what, what, what uh, remained is this distrust of the government, okay? <clears throat> okay, the relevance of the lecture, the Watergate scandal changed American politics forever, ending the do not question authority point of view. Today, as a result, <clears throat> the Americans question their leadership and think more critically about the presidency, okay? Okay, that is the end of Supplemental Election Number 14, Richard Nixon. Okay, so Gerald Ford becomes the president when Nixon resigns. He's the vice president. But most people, historians, believe he committed political suicide when he pardoned Nixon and would never be elected in 76. So a man kind of comes out of nowhere, Jimmy Carter, the 39th president. <clears throat> uh, he beats Ford in 76. So as we'll see... Carter largely ineffective in his one term. Connie was in awful shape in the 70s and during Carter's era. We're going to look more at Carter in the next chapter, okay? The other issue in the 70s that's huge is the energy crisis. There's a shortage of oil. Well, at least that's what OPEC said. <clears throat> so what is OPEC? OPEC stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, mostly Middle Eastern countries, formed to establish oil exporting policies and set prices, founded in 1960 to export large amounts of oil. So they claim that, that we're short of oil, so what happens? Supply and demand, gas prices skyrocket in the United States. But then it turns out that that wasn't quite the case. OPEC was lying. They just wanted to retaliate against the United States because the United States supplied Israel in a war against Arabic nations, okay? But it results in a shortage of oil, which results in a shortage of gas. So you have gas lines, uh, odd days and even days. So what does that mean? It means that if your license plate ended in an odd number, then you could only get gas on an odd number day, okay? Even the same way. Uh, so what this resulted in also was, was long lines everywhere you went. And it might take you a couple hours to get gas. So some students saw this as an opportunity. And they would what they would do is get the keys from a business owner or a businessman that needed to stay at work, couldn't couldn't take the time off to get gas for two hours, stay at work and for five or ten bucks, which was a lot of money in those days, they would take the man's car, sit in line and do your do your homework and study. Okay, so very American, right? Capitalist, very American way to find a negative, I'm sorry, find a positive out of a negative. Uh, let's take our next break here and watch our next film. This is a short film called The Gas Shortage of the 1970s. So go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. <clears throat> okay, so it's all about conserving oil. Everything changes and it becomes more like the world we have today, uh, where you start to have, you know, cars that are, are economical and, and, and miles per gallon that nobody ever cared about before because gas was 20, 30 cents a gallon. Who cares? You had, you had big cars before this. You had V8 motors. You know, we don't have, we don't, you don't see that anymore because it, because they gulp gasoline. They even changed the speed limit nationwide. Every highway anywhere in the middle of nowhere, you could only go 55 miles an hour. So I challenge you to go on the freeway and go do it in the slow lane because you'll be run over if you do it in the fast lane. Uh, go in the slow lane and drive 55 miles an hour for a mile or two and tell me if you could do that for an, uh, an hour if you were going a long distance. It's pretty slow and you almost believe you can run that fast. But it's all about it's all about being energy efficient. Cars became you know energy efficient, miles per gallon, all about better gas mileage, all to conserve oil. Okay, so the so conservation, preservation, all this becomes part of the 70s. It's a little bit of, a, of an overflow from the 60s, environmentalism and things like that, okay? So let's go to our, our next supplemental election, number 15. <clears throat> Whoops, there it is. Oh, one more. 
uh, no nukes, okay? No nukes meaning what? No nuclear power, no nuclear bombs, no nuclear anything, no nuclear energy. Let's do our um, outline. Number one, background development. Letter A, environmentalism gained popularity in the 1960s. Uh, letter B, nuclear power. And a, number one, uh, subset for nuclear power, no nukes. Number two, incidents. Letter A, China Syndrome. Letter B, Three Mile Island. Letter C, Chernobyl. Letter D, Fukushima Daiichi. Letter E, San Onofre. Number three, positives. Letter A, EPA. Letter B, Earth Day. Number four, relevance. Nuclear power had a very dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue, and the state of the environment became important to people, so nuclear power is in serious decline today, okay? Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> so this idea of environmentalism, this is an overflow of the 60s. This relates to 60s values, preservation, conservation. And this is in a response to oil spills, overpopulation, the threat of nuclear war, you know, all these things of the modern world. And so this moved people to be concerned with the state of the planet, okay? This would be brought into sharper view, and we're going to talk more about this in a minute, but the incident, the accident, Three Mile Island brought this into sharper view. Uh, nuclear power had been very popular since the 50s. It was seen as a clean, efficient method of power, and this would offset the oil shortage except for one small problem. A mistake would, could be deadly. A, a reactor meltdown would dump deadly radioactive waste into the atmosphere and potentially kill hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Okay, So, so no nukes became the next big cause. And all the baby boomers of the 60s that didn't have anything to complain about and, and protest about got out in the streets again. But also younger people, too. I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but many, most young people across the country jumped on this no nukes bandwagon. We don't want this. So the baby boomers are up in arms and protest. It was like the good old days. Of course, the greatest generation condoned nuclear power as the future and said, don't worry about meltdowns. That will never happen. So the government's saying it's a, it's a very minor chance that this could happen. And there's so many fail-safes, it'll never happen, okay? Uh, so that was that was that was kind of it. This is this is this is the way it was left. And and this 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 movement's trying to trying to get a foothold. And then a movie comes out called The China Syndrome, with famous people of that day, Jane Fonda, Michael Douglas, Jack Lemon. Jane Fonda and Michael Douglas are are old today, but still acting as we speak, okay? Uh, this is a very, very popular movie, and it's about the nuclear, uh, no nukes movement, okay? So what, what does China syndrome mean, okay? So what this means is if you have a problem in a reactor, when you have a reactor, it needs to be cooled all the time. Is it much, you know, heat goes on in there. The reaction creates heat. So you have to cool it over and over and over. Uh, if for some reason the cooling system broke down and and the heat wasn't wasn't cool it could it could result in the material inside melting through the concrete housing of the reactor and and that of course would be would be a, a disaster environmentally what the china syndrome means is that what they're saying is the meltdown would go through the bottom of the reactor and tunnel into the earth and keep on going because the because the nuclear waste, the nuclear material would, would keep on feeding it. And it would just it would burrow into the ground all the way to China. Now of course it not not really. It's 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 symbolic. It's a joke more than anything else, but but it's going to just dig into the ground and, and destroy the the the, the uh, vicinity around it. Okay. But not just that. <clears throat> It's going to bust out the top of the reactor, too, and, and throw it out into the atmosphere. Of course, what effect would that have? Because that's going to, you know, everyone's going to, everyone that's around there is going to be affected by that. Of course, we live in a, 
in an area that had a nuclear power plant, San Onofre, if that had happened there, it would have affected, it would have affected uh, millions of people probably, okay? But, so that's nice. The movie comes out and the greatest generation is laughing. Oh, yeah, sure. That, that would never happen. Don't worry about it. It's just a dumb movie. But then 12 days later, it happens. March 28, 1979. A minor cooling system malfunction caused a partial meltdown at Three Mile Island. Becomes a reality. Couldn't have planned any better. Hollywood movie comes out talking about something that never happened before. Twelve days later, it happens. Uh, now, in this case, uh, Three Mile Island was not a huge disaster. Uh, it, uh, it, there was a minor cooling system malfunction that caused a partial meltdown. There was damage to one of the reactors, but very little ra radiation was released into the environment due to the surrounding primary containment vessel vessels. So no deaths or radiation sickness have been officially attributed to the meltdown at Three Mile Island, but the accident caused public concern right on the, you know, at the right after this movie came out. So everyone jumps jumps on this bandwagon, and new plants that were to be built were were deauthorized. So this this is kind of the opening act for the no nukes movement is Three Mile Island. Were there any other uh, meltdowns? There was Chernobyl, Russia. This is huge, a huge meltdown. This would happen uh, seven years later. Uh, this is in the Ukraine and Russia, August 26, 1986, the world's worst. Nuclear disaster happens when an explosion in a nuclear power plant unleashed 200 times more radioactivity into the air than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombs combined and forever altered the lives of 7 million people. Although the symptoms can take years before they appear. So the actual result of the, of the explosion, 30 people were killed by the accident, two immediately 28 inside of a month from acute radiation poisoning. But truthfully, from that point on, it's hard to tell how many people in that area died in the next 30, 40 years because cancer is so prevalent in today's societies. Who's to say that, that their cancer came from living around Chernobyl? But there have been 7,000 incidents, 7,000 incidents of thyroid cancer in the Chernobyl area. Thyroid cancer is an unusual and rare type of cancer. So is that a coincidence? Uh, seems unlikely, okay? Uh, and the other frightening aspect of this, I just said that it was 200 times more than the two bombs combined, but only 3% of the radioactivity, uh, radioactive material in the reactor went into the atmosphere. That means that 97% is still there today. Uh, nuclear waste, nuclear material, they don't break down. It takes thousand years before it's, it's no longer radioactive. It doesn't, you know, just fade away like most things. Uh, so what to do with nuclear waste is a huge issue. It's an issue at San Onofre in our, in our own county. It's an issue here. Uh, they're still trying to figure out what to do here in Chernobyl all these years later. Um, 35 or so years later, um, they're, they're like, it's like a ticking time bomb. So people don't go here. If you go there today, you, you need a hazmat suit that covers your entire body because there's still radiation there in high levels. Nobody lives anymore within miles of this plant because of this event that happened all those years ago. So does nuclear power have a downside? All these years later, it's still spewing out radiation. Are there any other um, incidents? Wasn't that long ago, 2011, powerful earthquake in Japan. And this powerful earthquake created a tsunami, a huge wave, 100 feet tall, hit the east shore of Japan. The earthquake was so large, it actually moved the entire island of Japan, the main island, six feet to the east, okay? That's a remarkable amount of energy. So the tsunami um, hits the coastline, and on the coastline was a nuclear power plant. And when the, uh, when the wave hit the, the power plant at Fukushima Daisha, 
the power gens were quickly flooded. This knocked the vital cooling system offline. This caused reactor fuel rods to begin to melt down and leak this deadly radiation into the surrounding area. Uh, 16 hours into the disaster, the fuel rods in one reactor had almost completely melted with the other two cl close behind. But, but nobody knew this. It was kind of like, what's going on? And nobody would say. It was hush-hush. It wouldn't be another until another 88 days, three months almost, until the Japanese government finally admitted that a meltdown had occurred. But the American government did the same thing. The American government immediately took a positive stance, optimistic stance. Don't worry about it. It's under control. Listen to what we say. Well, we we, we know the American public aren't listening to you. So we're, we're worried about this. And they had maps on the news channels that showed this big wave of radiation that was coming across the Pacific toward the United States. And it hit the entire coast and kept on going. They say by the time it got here, it, 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 there wasn't anything to worry about, but, you know, who's to say? Uh, so the, uh, a radiation wave hit this country in 2011. How, how uh, strong and potent it was is, is another question, but it definitely did that, okay? Uh, so don't worry. Everything's, everything's fine, okay? Uh, this, this disaster continued for weeks. This became the worst nuclear disaster since the 1986 Chernobyl incident. And they have the same problem here. You can't get near there. You can't live near there. The entire area is still flooded with radiation because by far most of the material is still there oozing out as we speak. Of course, we have our own power plant in San Onofre, a San Onofre nuclear power plant built in 1968. But in 19, I'm sorry, 2012, it was found that wear on the plant was premature. This raised eyebrows. And Barbara Boxer, the California senator, she determined that the plant was unsafe and posed a danger to the 8 million people living within 50 miles of the plant. Of course, that would include us here, okay? So the plant was decommissioned in 2013 due to the failure of much of its equipment. Of course, today... They still are trying to figure out what to do with all that nuclear waste, okay? Uh, way back, they used to put it in big plastic containers and take it out in the middle of the ocean and drop it, and drop it to the bottom of the ocean. So I don't know how many of these, these containers are out there, but they're, they're in the bottom of the ocean, and they say that the plastic won't deteriorate. Uh, who's to say? I, I guess we have to believe them, right? They wouldn't lie to us, would they? Okay, uh, some positives that came out of the no nukes movement, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. What does this do? This forces developers to do an environmental study of their project, construction project, to determine what effect it's going to have on the environment. And many times a project is, is you know, um, not allowed because of the effects it may have on the environment. Also, Earth Day came out of the no nukes movement. What is that? This is a celebration of, of, of the planet, 20 million people calling for a safer planet, okay? Okay, the relevance of this lecture. Nuclear power had a very dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue, and the state of the environment became important to people. So nuclear power is in serious decline today, okay? That is the end of supplemental lecture number 15, no nukes. Let's keep going. So when this class started, we learned about the Industrial Revolution. That's a big deal. That's a huge part of American as well as world history, uh, changing from an agrarian world to an industrial world. But then, but then in the 70s, you have what's called deindustrialization. This is the opposite. What does this mean? It means all these factories that were built in the north especially – all over, all, all the cities in the north with, with their factories, suddenly they're all deserted. Why? Because overseas uh, competition and cheap labor caused for many of these American industries to end because they they were doing it in, in a foreign country, uh, foreign to America anyway, cheaper, okay? So these places end and the opportunities are, are over. All these men and women that worked there were out of work. And this this is a huge part of the 70s. 
was uh, steel, especially after decades of production came to an abrupt end and the plants are still sitting there empty. And today in certain parts of uh, the, you know, Pittsburgh area, you've got, you've got uh, communities of homes that are empty, looted. And this happens throughout all the Northeastern cities. So, these these uh, these factories just sitting there rusting away. This is now called the Rust Belt. You've heard of the Green Belt and you know, different different kind of the the uh, the uh, Bible Belt is the South and and so on. This is the Rust Belt. The old factories are sitting there rotting away and no one knows what to do with them. Okay, uh, deserted plants mean people are out of work. So the seventies was depressing on many levels. Okay, so look, going back to politics, even after Nixon's missteps with Watergate, conservative politics continued. Uh, the liberalism of the Democratic Party did not gain because of Watergate, and conservatism would continue all the way up until Barack Obama. So I mentioned before about Bill Clinton being an exception a little bit here. <clears throat> What about civil rights? What happened with that? Interest waned considerably after the 60s, you know, probably because there were so many gains. You gained a lot, but, you know, there, there's still more gains to be had. Uh, this this, this uh, idea called affirmative action comes out in the 70s. So what is this? This is an attempt to right the wrongs to the marginalized people that have been in American uh, culture that were kept from opportunities. African Americans in the Jim Crow South, uh, returning veterans that didn't get the GI or you know uh, couldn't get the GI Bill because of racism and deed of covenants, all those kind of things. Missing out on the wealth of owning property because they wouldn't give you a loan. Uh, this this is this this is a crime, okay? And this is this is not American. Equal opportunity, opportunity for all, freedom, liberty. That's not American, but it happened. So affirmative action was a was an attempt, and I can say that it was it was it was meant well. It doesn't turn out so well, but it was meant well. So affirmative action meant that in business and in schools, like so so young people trying to get into college, uh, that these places would consider the disadvantages of, my, of minority groups and women and create an advantage for them. So positions were set aside for minorities. So if you're gonna if you're gonna bring in ten students or ten employees, in the past you would you would bring in the ten most qualified. That was that's the argument anyway. Now perhaps you're ten. It says there's ten positions, but you got to bring in three African Americans and three Hispanic Americans. Then you can go from there. Okay, so white people scream, "This is reverse discrimination. You are not discriminating against me for being white." Uh, and many times a white person more qualified was passed over to give these people an opportunity. So, you know, the, the way I try to put this into perspective, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, but, but you know, if, if you're a, you know, I, I like to swim, okay? I, I go swimming once in a while. So if somebody said to me, okay, you're a swimmer, yeah. Okay, I want you to race Michael Phelps. And if you win, you can go to college or you can, I'll give you a house, whatever it is. Well, I mean, how am I going to do that? Yeah, I could swim, but I'm I'm old and I'm not a trained athlete, and you know, I, I'm not going to beat Michael Phelps. Come on. Well, I mean, what do you mean? I'm I'm letting you compete. Jump in the pool. If you beat him, then you'll you'll get the advantage. Well, that that's what I'm. That's the point I'm trying to make. I I'm not a trained athlete. I didn't have access to that. Nobody gave me access to that. He had access to that. He trained his whole life. He's going to beat me. So that's kind of the analogy here. You know, you you're trying to just just because everything's all equal now, you can't just say, okay, Mr. African American, go in there and compete against Mr. White Man who's went to Yale and you didn't get a chance to, right? It's not fair. You can't compete. It's not it's not a it's not an equal playing field. He has all the advantages because of the life he was afforded that you didn't get. So affirmative action tried to fix that by giving you uh, perhaps an opportunity over him. OK, uh, so it sounds nice. It's very liberal. Uh, it sounds nice, but it, it, it doesn't turn out so well. OK, um, so affirmative action, progressive nations want to follow positive discrimination. Uh, it's a democratic 
democratic process of development with, with just and equitable growth, uh, to provide employment opportunities to the marginalized for their economic liberalization, and, um, and the last one, to partner with building an inclusive society. So that, that's the idea behind it, okay? But it, but it backfires. A man named Baki, uh, a man trying to get into the University of California, is denied. And ahead of him are people of non-white people that he feels weren't as qualified. So he sues, and he wins in court. Uh, and the system was called in question, especially the quota system. Uh, the call for certain numbers of minorities to be admitted. Okay, so this whole thing kind of kind of dissolves and falls apart. But uh, and, and, you know, an indication, even though it's it's looked back on not fondly by many people, it's 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 an attempt to try to right the wrongs. Okay, uh, so ultimately, this system was called into question and was prohibited in California. Okay. Another movement of the 70s is the ERA. This, this is picking up where the 20s dropped off. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This is what the amendment was going to say. Okay, So this is, this is trying to give women the same rights as men in all aspects of society. And it almost gets through as, as an amendment, but it doesn't. Uh, many women wanted to remain in, in their traditional roles in the home. So the, you know, this, 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 uh, this independent woman of the twenties is gone. And here you are in the seventies and you're back in the kitchen again. Right. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly on the right here. This is a woman. She was against this. It was a very conservative woman. She came. Uh, so the feminist movement is just not compatible with happiness. They are not for equality. They want to kill everything masculine. There was concern about if women are, are equal, are they going to be forced to be drafted and, and fight in combat? Okay. Uh, this came very close to being ratified, but narrowly missed as late as 1982. Uh, another huge uh, event in the 70s is Roe v. Wade. And this is regarding abortion. This is still a controversial issue today. This is still a, a major source of anger and, and conflict today. Uh, president Trump became the president in 2016 and campaigned on overturning this. And he still talks about overturning Roe v. Wade. What does that mean? It means that abortion on any level would be illegal in America. Okay. So in the early 1960s, abortion was illegal. You couldn't get an abortion. But this landmark case said it was legal in the first trimester and was protected by rights to privacy, it made it a woman's choice. So this whole, whole idea of pro-life or in pro-choice, pro-life meaning that you're anti-abortion, you're pro-life no matter what, that, that little fetus has the right to live, or your pro-choice, a woman should have the right to choose over about her own body. Uh, so this becomes uh, this is a big one. It still rages today. Is it was that the end of it? No, it still goes on. And you have religious aspects that are brought into this. Thoughts about birth control, and we still have these arguments today. You know, many religions still still are against birth control, and religion gets involved in 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 people and culture. Okay. So you have a conservative backlash, and you have the return of evangelicism and the return of family values. Not the return, perhaps the, perhaps the origin of it. So family values is this idea of mixing religion with politics and promoting your party and yourself as a virtuous person who believes in these things. It, it truly is a way to get votes. But you're mixing religion and politics. So understand that you're not supposed to do that in this country. This country was about separation between church and state. This is not an anti-religion uh, point of view. It's simply saying we don't want to be like Europe. We left there for a reason. We don't want a state religion. We don't want to be beholden to a religion. We don't want to be told that you got to be this religion in this country. In European countries, you could lose your life in the, in the past if you didn't follow the state religion. So the United States was not going to be about that. And this is what the Constitution says. Congress shall make no law 
respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So it's, it's not saying that you can't uh, practice your religion. It's saying that you can just do it privately. <clears throat> Don't mix it in with the public because the public in a free country is all religions. We can't have <clears throat> one be dominant over that's that goes against the freedom idea. OK, this is a huge <clears throat> question even today. But 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 politicians today are taking religion and family values and, and kind of mixing it all up into their campaign. And essentially, it's against the Constitution. OK, uh, <clears throat> this came. We talked about Dan Quayle last class, this handsome man that the Republicans thought they had their next John Kennedy, right? There he's in the left. And he became the family values politician. This was George Bush Sr.'s vice president. <clears throat> and like I said, very initially very popular, in the, and the Republicans thought they found their next big guy, okay? Uh, but famous for delivering a family values speech in 1992 where he chided the popular TV show at that time called Murphy Brown. This is a fictional show about a 40-something-year-old woman, a divorced news anchor, played by the actor Candace Bergen on a CBS sitcom, for her decision to have a child outside of marriage, to have a child as a single woman. She decides that, you know, I'm not married. I, I, I have a career. I don't have time to be married. I'm not going to meet anybody, but I really want to have a child. So I'm going to go ahead and have one outside of marriage, okay? This is the 90s. Times were changing. You know, this is more of the world we live in today, right? This is not that long ago. Dan Quayle responds to this TV show and goes on, on television himself and, and gives a speech. Bearing babies irresponsibly is simply wrong. Failing to support children when his father is wrong. We must be unequivocal about this. It doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, highly paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. Okay, let's take a break here and watch the film that entitled Murphy Brown versus Vice President Dan Quayle. Go ahead and watch that film and come back. So Quayle's argument that Brown was sending the wrong message that single parenthood should not be encouraged erupted into a major campaign controversy. Who are you to tell me what I should do? This is another, a woman speaking. If I want to have a child out of wedlock and be a single parent, I'm going to do it. It's a free country. And you have no right to tell me what I should be doing just because you're the vice president. These kind of things aren't up to you. Do politics. Let us figure out our our, our social life. Stay out of it. Okay. Um, Let's take another break and watch two films back to back. Uh, one is called, um, let's see, where am I here? How to Lose the Presidency, Dan Quayle Misspells Potato. And the next one is Iconic, You're No Jack Kennedy, Debate Moment. Uh, go ahead and watch those two films and then come on back. So, so Quayle, a, a huge misstep, right? I mean, many times the Presidents, vice presidents, first ladies, they, they go to schools and the cameras are there to show them being nice to the students. It's all about PR. But here's Quayle watching a spelling uh, contest in a classroom and a boy spells potato correctly, P-O-T-A-T-O. -O, and the vice president of the country says, excuse me, son, but you spelled that incorrectly. Potato has an E on the end. And the kid kind of like, what? Doesn't have any on the end. So he looks pretty pretty foolish here, okay? And, of course, the second film brings back this idea of Jack Kennedy, this 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 idea that the, that the Republicans found their next vibrant, young, and regal, and handsome young guy. It fell apart. You're no Jack Kennedy, okay? So the religious right is born in the 1990s. Uh, conservative politicians push family values and a return to religion to get votes. Is this right? The Republican Party has become the party of family values and the start of the religious right. Okay. Uh, again, this is not exactly constitutional. It's not supposed to be that way. And I'm not just trying to pick on the Republicans. Many Democrats also say, 
you know, and God bless America. And of course we have, you know, uh, in God we trust in our money and the Pledge of Allegiance says the same thing. And people argue about this back and forth. And again, I'm not trying to sell it one way or the other, but, you know, it's an argument that people say religious people want prayer in the school. Well, that's nice if you're a Christian, but if you're not a Christian, you don't believe in those prayers. And I'm that kid's parents. I don't want that my child to be exposed to that. So, again, you're not supposed to have it in the public world. Keep religion separate and private. Let your kids come to school and learn in a secular fashion. And then on the weekends, go learn about religion. That's the way that that, that was the way it was designed. Is it is that the way that it is? I, I would say not necessarily. OK, OK, that is the end of chapter 29. Thank you.